Hi, Stu. How are you today? Um, well, thanks, Astrid. Thanks for having me uh, on the show. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm very, very excited to have you on. Uh, there's a lot of questions we want to get into. You are amazing what you do. And I've heard you talking you. so much about protein. I love protein. And I think that it is, it is my favorite macronutrient. There's so much things that are not known yet on what are the mechanisms in, with protein uh, in satiety, um, in fat loss, uh, in muscle gain. So there's so much that we don't know yet that I am very interested to, to hear your thoughts, you, your area of, of expertise, obviously, and just bring some more light into these topics, especially there's a lot of confusion out there sometimes might be a little bit of fear because protein is bad for you for some reason people believe that and obviously there's been a there's been a, a long time of history where we have this battle of vegans and carnivores and ketos and everyone seems to have the an answer uh, for justifying their beliefs so I guess we need to really go back to our science and see, well, what the science actually says. And again, it, com it might be confusing because there are studies that support their beliefs uh, and their biases. Mm -hmm. So really trying to see, be as less biased as possible and aim for what is the real, the reality when we look at the studies and try to be as unbiased, even if, we, if you have a belief uh, and it can be very difficult for you to because you do research and sometimes you might be expecting some results but you don't see those and you see yep. something yeah. different and how you report that back to to the public uh, especially if that goes against what you believe that it would be so yeah. I don't know I think the main thing I wanted to start with is your a little bit of your background why you decided to be in research and why protein <laughs> yeah uh, so uh, sort of a long story, but uh, a, a, a one that I've told a few times. Uh, I was quite convinced that uh, I was heading for a career in medicine. And then in my last year of university, I was a rugby player and I, and I broke my leg. And so I couldn't play rugby. And so I ended up doing a thesis project and going into the lab. And uh, it really just opened my eyes to, to research. And um, I think the rest is sort of history. I, I don't know that if you had told me uh, when I was in my last year of university, you're going to be a university professor. This is what you're going to do. I'd have been, no, nah, I don't think so. But uh, so here I am. Uh, it's worked out pretty well, I think. Uh, why protein? Uh, you know, it, it's sort of by chance. Uh, the project, the first project I got assigned to as a master's student uh, was around protein and protein requirements. And it was always something that was interesting to me because it was a nice blend between something that I really cared about as an athlete and then a macronutrient that I knew was really important in muscular development, although I didn't know too much back then. And so it's been really uh, gratifying to be able to uh, uncover some of the details and uh, get into some of the mechanisms. So I don't think it was really a choice as much. Uh, it was something I got assigned to and really just uh, uh, f felt really passionate about, so. That's awesome. Um, and what do you study when, when you were studying your bachelor's degree? Yeah, so um, I, I was a biochemist. I did a, a degree in biochemistry and they did a master's degree in biochemistry and a PhD in physiology. Uh, I teach in a kinesiology department and I always joke that if they had had kinesiology when I was an undergrad, I would have, I would have taken it, but it was, um, Back when I was an undergraduate, which was a long time ago now, um, it was actually, you would have called it physical education. So okay. it was a little bit different than it is now, but kinesiology, the science of uh, human movement and metabolism have uh, really come to the forefront. Yeah, no, it is amazing. And I really like the areas, particularly because I am a dietitian that works in a clinical setting as well especially in a rehab hospital. And I see obviously a lot of older, older people very uh, they're trying to get better, but there is a lot of high risk of malnutrition and a lot of uh, wasting. People don't really look at protein intake and movement as something that is vital. Um, 
that's where I see that this area is super important to sort of move forward. So that's why I also love protein because um, it is important across the board. It is not just for uh, middle-aged women or uh, someone who wants to fat, to lose fat or build muscle, but like across the board, even children uh, looking at people that are very, very old. I think there is a statistic that every, every decade you need higher protein intake to prevent muscle loss. Is that correct? Yeah. So one of the things that a lot of people ask is, um, you know, when does muscle loss begin? You know, when do you, and it's a hard question to answer. I think for the most part, people's muscle mass peaks in their, probably their twenties. And it probably stays pretty stable for some people into your thirties. But I think the more sedentary you are, you can probably begin to measure muscle loss for some people, even in their early forties and mid forties, and definitely by their fifties, they'd be demonstrating it. And most people, you can begin to see it when they're in their sixties. So um, I, I think that it's probably fair to say that um, the older you get, the you need more protein to restore that muscle. And obviously all of this against a background, uh, the more physically active you are, the better things tend to be. So do you think you need more protein because uh, you sort of, the older you get, the less you move and you're higher risk of losing the muscle because you're not using it as much as you were when you were younger? Or are there other factors that obviously increase that risk of muscle loss? So I think that there's two things. I think that there's um, an aging program that happens and it's probably multifactorial starting with you don't absorb as much protein, uh, not as much protein goes out to your muscle, your muscle doesn't take up as much, your muscle doesn't use it as efficiently and we can call that an aging program and I think that that's difficult to overcome. But one thing that we do know is that it doesn't matter whether you're a human, a cat, a dog, a mouse, as you get older, you tend to do less. And so, you know, anybody that's able to maintain that level of physical activity for longer is probably going to be um, in a healthier state and more young looking in terms of their metabolism, at least uh, for, for longer. So I think it's probably a combination of the, of the both is that you, you age, you do less, and you're also less efficient at utilizing protein. Okay, got it. Now, what's wrong with the RDA of 0.8 grams per kilogram? What are your thoughts on that? Because I don't think there seems to be a, an agreement of that that's not enough. I obviously see that, like, don't go less than that, like the, your minimum, like just aim for that. Would, if you eat a very, very low protein, but that would be your minimum. But I wouldn't say like, oh, just go and just eat 0.8 grams of protein and you'll be fine. So what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, it, you make a good point. And, and I think a lot of people misunderstand what the RDA is about. It is a minimum requirement to achieve nitrogen balance. That's the method that we use to define the RDA. And uh, it, it, was never con it was never devised to be a target. It's not like people should aim at this. It was simply said like, if we're gonna get people to be in nitrogen balance and from the best of our understanding at the time, that's good health, um, then this is what we should aim at. But it, it was never set out to be, you know, this is where really you need to be. It's just that this is the minimum. And then what we've sort of discovered subsequently is not only that it may not be correct to be the minimum, particularly for older people, um, but that certain health benefits go with consuming more than the RDA. So um, it, it, it's probably a number that I, I doubt whether it will ever change, uh, at least maybe in my lifetime. Um, but I think that there's been enough research now to say with confidence that uh, consumption of protein intakes above the RDA are associated with uh, a lot of health benefits and probably that pe some people uh, need more protein than the RDA. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So let me tell me something about what would be in then the best way to determine the, the, re the protein requirements for someone? Like are there major factors you consider before coming up with the amount of protein per body, per body weight? Or is it just like, uh, I think it used to be between 1.4 and 1.6. So like, do you actually have um, an objective 
idea of why you should be doing this specific amount of protein? Yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, there's still a lot of controversy around what is the best method. You know, the balance of nitrogen, which is essentially the balance of protein, is the stand pat sort of method that a lot of people use. Like it is for a lot of other nutrients, balance of calcium, balance of zinc, for example. Um, I think some more sophisticated methods have been developed. Uh, not going too deep into those, but it, you know. At the really basal sort of understanding, what you need to imagine is that you, you're not 100% efficient at retaining protein. Your body is turning over protein in your body all the time. So you're making new proteins, but you're breaking down old proteins. And a certain proportion of the, the amino acids that come from that are simply lost, mostly as urea. So that's the nitrogen and then the carbon skeleton. So the, the, the bottom line is you have a need for dietary protein on a daily basis. And some people, you know, as they get older, they, their, their needs are going to climb. If they're an athlete and they're oxidizing lots of uh, fuels, including a little bit, not a, not a ton, but, uh, you know, a, a, a big expenditure of a small amount is still a significant amount of protein. Or if you're subjecting yourself to a, some sort of stimulus where you're trying to grow more protein, like a, a kid, or if you're trying to grow muscle, uh, then you're gonna need more. Determining exactly how much people require, it, it takes some pretty, some pretty uh, sophisticated in lab methods. But again, the estimates that these methods have come up with are consistently in the range of a minimum, I would say of about 1.2 grams. So 50% uh, greater than the RDA of 0.8 and as high as probably about 1.6. And then uh, beyond that, there may be some people, but I think it begins to uh, diminish in terms of uh, the return you can expect. Okay, is that 1.2 grams per kilogram? Yes. Body weight, yeah. Because uh, there is a lot of uh, different literature that actually goes even as high as 2.2, 2.4. So what would be the benefit to go higher? If you say that generally they estimate that would be for like just general population, the 1.2 to 1.6, but like if you were up to 2.3, 2.5, three grams per kilogram, what what would be the the risk? I would say what, what would be wrong with going higher? Yeah, so I think a lot of people and there there are estimates, and even from our lab that have been as high as 2.2 grams per kilo. So that's the one gram per pound. Uh, type estimate. And I think that, uh, you know, in athletic populations that are putting themselves under a severe amount of stress, or if you're in an, a, a caloric deficit trying to uh, lose weight, but in our hands, we all, would always say you'd like to preserve muscle, so consume more protein in that phase, um, that those intakes are probably valid. There's, there's no, I, I wouldn't uh, disagree with those at all. I think the two uh, big things that people have said in the past, maybe there's risk associated with those intakes. The first is uh, the protein acidifies your blood and it causes you to lose calcium from your bone. And, uh, and, and we know now that that's not true. Um, of all of the nutrients that are bone supportive, calcium is probably number one. Uh, vitamin D is number two or vitamin D, depending on where you are. And, and protein is actually number three. I mean, it's a bone supportive nutrient and I think it's surprising to most people to learn that 40 uh, to 50% of your bone mass is actually protein. It's not, it's not just I'll calcium. See. It's not, it's not a stick of chalk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other one uh, is, is the protein causes uh, kidney failure. And uh, sometimes people throw in the liver as well. And I'm never really sure why, but, um, but let's, let's just say this is that um, when it comes to that, hypothesis, which is about 60 years old now, there's actually no evidence for it actually happening in humans. And in clinical trials, and we've done a big meta-analysis on this, um, we can't find any evidence that that's the case. So a lot of people say, oh, you just, there's evidence, but you can't find it. And, and so I always ask, I'm like, well, what's your best evidence that it, that it does happen? And then it's silence. You know, I usually don't get any replies. So um, I, I'm, I'm really not convinced that there's a causative role for protein uh, in kidney failure. But if you do have someone with lower kidney function, 
it probably makes sense to keep their protein intake lower. So okay, it makes a lot of sense. And when you think about obese population, um, and you want to sort of calculate protein for them, if if you are going to put them in a calorie deficit, but obviously they are in a special situation because they have already a lot of storage and like adipose tissue is relatively uh, a protector of the muscle mass, especially if you're in a calorie deficit for, for um, the meantime, they are losing a lot of fat. So they have that energy availability. What would be the recommendation or how would you best calculate the requirements of protein based on, like you prefer to use a, the rule of using lean body mass uh, or you prefer to use the, the, the general recommendation of, well, just go 1.2 grams per kilogram or whatever. Right. It, it's a great question uh, and one that I get asked a lot. And I don't know that I have a great answer, but this is sort of my, my, my rules of thumb are, are, are this, is that I think you could choose to, to target protein at someone's ideal body weight. And I mean, people can argue about that. Certainly, if you knew the person's lean mass or, or, or fat-free mass, then that would be a, a good estimate to use. So somewhere between 1.2, 1.6 um, per kilogram of fat-free mass, uh, I, would, I would think is fine. The upper end of where things, you know, probably you, you can't, you know, get much more benefit out of protein in, is really, I think about sort of 25 to 30% of your total energy intake. So that's what I use as the top end. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you're giving people protein intakes that are much higher than that, I, I don't think that you're um, giving them a fuel that, they, that their body can use. I mean, we can digest a lot of protein, but what our body does with it is, uh, is fairly limited. We don't, um, you know, have a place to store protein. It's not like fat. Uh, it's not like carbohydrate. You, you can't just, there's no, you can sort of put it into a few places, but then after that, you, you have to get rid of it. So I think for uh, overweight or obese people, I like the, uh, the estimate of, of fat-free mass, if you can get that, that estimate. And, and if not, um, you could use ideal body weight, or if not, you could use the actual body weight, but probably not exceed about uh, 25 to 30% of total energy coming from protein. Yeah, that makes sense. And what would be your thoughts if someone is, has a very large amount of calories uh, compared to someone who has a very limited budget of calories, let's say 1200 calories. So would that be very different in terms of your approach to determine how much protein this person should be having? Yeah, another great question. I mean, I think, you know, so the lower the, 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 the energy budget that somebody has, the more you would like to emphasize nutrient dense sources of protein. I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're gonna have to get all of your nutrients that you require anyway. So this is where, you know, you get into this argument around, is it animal-based or plant-based? And my answer is always that it's much easier to get all of the nutrients that you need if you're getting your protein from animal-based sources. I mean, that's just the, the way things are made, you know, more calcium in dairy, more iron, more zinc in, in, in meat. That's just the way things are. Um, so yeah, if you're down at the very low end of the, uh, the energy intake, then you really want to try and emphasize protein and you can probably push it up even higher. Um, it's still around preservation of lean mass, if you like, um, what we refer to as a higher quality weight loss. So you're losing fat as opposed to lean and that's what the protein is supporting. Okay, it makes sense. And you mentioned that we don't have a protein storage, right? Uh, yeah. like we do with carbs and fats. So in this case, is any protein distribution really significant when it comes to the context of maybe muscle gain or muscle loss prevention? Uh, or like if we think about specific uh, cases like elderly or catabolic states or even in a calorie deficit, what, how significant is to distribute protein evenly, let's say like the general recommendation would be just aim for 0.4 grams of protein per kilogram uh, per meal and just try to distribute it every four hours. So how correct is that statement? And does that make, how much sense does that make in reality? 
Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think that people um, can identify the fact that, you know, if you eat a lot of fat, you, you have an almost unlimited capacity to store it, it would seem. Uh, and carbohydrates can be stored uh, in your muscle as glycogen or in your liver as glycogen. And then sort of the overflow is you can make acetyl units and you can de novo make lipids. Uh, protein's much more difficult to, to turn into, uh, into fat. There's a, probably only about one or two amino acids that are truly lipogenic. Um, so from that standpoint, it, it, it's, it's really there, because as I said, that there's nowhere to store it, uh, you have to use it. You have to make something with the amino acids that you're getting, um, or you have to just pull the nitrogen off, make urea, and then do something with a carbon skeleton. Usually you burn it, you oxidize it, or you, in some cases, turn it into blood glucose. Uh, so from the standpoint of uh, you know, that framework then, trying to understand you know, if you had a limited amount and, and instead of getting it in one big meal, uh, as opposed to the smaller meals like you were talking about, um, I think that there's some merit to that. The, the hard part is understanding exactly where that per meal threshold is. And I think we've got some numbers um, that are reasonable uh, estimates, but they might not be spot on correct in terms of looking at how that protein can be used. So uh, I know some people believe that the per meal dose can be even higher. Uh, and from a lot of standpoints, feed not just muscle, which is the tissue that we look at, but other, other protein contain, or excuse me, protein requiring processes at the whole body level. Um, I think that that's a little bit controversial, uh, but what I'll say is that to me, it makes more sense to distribute your protein evenly throughout the day than it does to save it all and then eat a lot in one meal because you just can't use it all in that one meal, so. Okay, so the, I, probably, I think probably that is associated with this common myth that a lot of people say, well, you cannot absorb more than 20 grams of protein in one meal. So you better just uh, get it on no more than 25 grams of protein or no more than 20 grams, knowing that you knowing that you cannot, that's not really true, that you can always pretty much absorb 100% of the protein. Um, even if you eat only one meal uh, of, I don't know, 90 grams of protein, what does the body do with the excess of protein? Like you mentioned that obviously not everything is dedicated to MPS or muscle protein synthesis. So if you just utilized, let's say 20 grams of protein for that particular process, if you ate 90 grams of protein, what happened with the rest of the protein? Where does it go? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And so to your point, I mean, I think that this is one of the critical points that people, so I think people have misinterpreted it. I don't know whether it's our paper, but certainly our one of our early papers on a dose response contributed to this myth of you can only absorb, and that's not the right, you know, answer to the question, um, 20 grams of protein. It's that a 20 gram protein dose maximize the muscle protein synthetic response. And, and, and various people have sort of messed around with that number. And let's just say, you know, plus or minus, I would probably say, let's say on the plus side, maybe up to 30 grams, you, you can't really go. And it doesn't matter how much muscle you have, even if you're an enormous individual, I don't think you can go much higher than that. But you can certainly eat and ingest, you know, 100, 150 grams, and your body will absorb most of that. So what happens to it is, is that all of the protein requiring processes then make use of the amino acids while they're in your bloodstream and elevated. And any amino acids that aren't used, there might be some metabolic fates and et cetera, you're gonna have, so nitrogen in, a, in a, uh, any system, it doesn't matter. If you're a fish, you excrete nitrogen through your gills as ammonia. If you're a bird, you excrete it as uric acid. If you're a mammal, you make urea. So the nitrogen is taken off of the amino acid. Once you've done that, it's not an amino acid anymore. It's a carbon skeleton. Sometimes it's a keto acid and you have other fates. Uh, you can burn it. You can make, um, you could use it as fuel. Uh, you could make glucose from it. You could use it and make uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle intermediates. Um, but beyond that, it, it, it's, uh, it's not useful anymore. It's not used as 
an amino acid because you've lost the amino nitrogen and it's been made into urea. So, you know, the studies in which people have done these dose responses and then included a uh, tracer to measure urea production show that the high doses, you do get a stimulation, but it plateaus off. And then what you get is an increasing urea production or an increasing amino acid oxidation. So you, you, you're burning the substrate that you've delivered as, as fuel. So it's, uh, it gets used, but it certainly okay. doesn't get used to make new proteins. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that- oh, I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad that it makes a lot of sense because it, it, it takes some time for people to realize the difference between those things. So it's, uh, I, I'm pleased to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it hundred percent makes sense. And I think the other point of this huge controversy with protein and like eating in a surplus when you eat, like we hear sometimes, and I think I see the, I'm, I'm seeing myself saying this all the time. If you're going to overeat, overeat protein, uh, because there's research that shows that it seems like in a surplus of protein, uh, it doesn't have the same effect as if you had that surplus coming from fats or from carbs. Uh, even in, like, how does that affect body composition? Like, are you aware of any mechanism or reason why a surplus of protein doesn't lead to an increase of fat mass, but it actually helps the building lean body mass, like was in Tony's study? Yeah. Hey, look, I mean, I think that there's probably several mechanisms that are going on. So first, uh, when we ingest food, we have that thermic effect and so our body temperature goes up. So our metabolism is, is working to digest what we've just eaten. And you ingest pure carbohydrate, pure fat or pure, pure, pure protein, um, the thermic effect of eating protein is higher. So you burn a little bit more energy. Uh, at the same time, protein is probably, well, it's not probably, it's the most difficult substrate to turn into fat. So if you're, as you said, if you're going to overconsume anything, overconsume protein um, and don't worry about your bones or, or your kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, I, I do think that um, what it does is it helps support the tissue that in certain states uh, is really, you know, in a lot of athletic populations is very metabolically active. You know, if you take uh, all of the, the components of our resting energy expenditure, uh, it really comes down to our liver, which is small, but very metabolically active. Our kidneys, again, very small, but quite metabolically active. And then our skeletal muscle, it, it's not particularly metabolically active unless you're active, um, but you have a lot of it. So if you go out and you do something physically active every day, you're turning on it's almost like turning up the thermostat on on in in a house. You're, you know, it's it might not be much, but it's it's there's so much of it that you're just burning a little bit more energy. So I think that it's probably a combination of those things and the fact that if you consume more protein, you're displacing um, fats and and carbohydrates, which can be easily stored or more easily stored, I should say. And it re it sort of comes to that association of protein be also a very important in satiety. So are you aware of like, how would you be able to explain what is the mechanism, a mechanism of why protein is so important in satiety? What, what does the protein has or does in your brain, in your body to signal this, this plenty of food, like we are associated, why? Yeah. <laughs> Great question, and uh, my my uh, my writer's statement is that I'm not a protein and satiety person, but it, it's I, I think that there's pretty good consensus, and so and you know I've been privileged to uh, give talks and appear in the same program as people like Harvey Anderson, Marguerite Westerterp, and Rick Mattis, who are probably you know Heather Leedy, some of the best protein satiety people, and so I I learn by sitting next to them. Um, I think that there's probably two mechanisms. First is that the gut hormonal response that we now know is, is pretty uh, responsible for suppression of appetite. Protein favors an appetite suppressing effect to a greater degree than say carbohydrate or, or lipid. 
And at the same time, there are people who advocate for a, uh, a neurogenic effect that there are amino acids that signal from a neurotransmitter standpoint to say, you know, I'm full. And I think, uh, again, and the evidence for this in humans is a little bit softer than it is for some species, but the protein uh, leverage hypothesis that'll, that um, has been developed by uh, Jeff Simpson, for example, would say that you know, below a certain protein intake, animals tend to engage in a foraging activity and humans fall into this category as well, maybe, uh, and eat more in an attempt to get the protein that they need. Uh, I don't know whether there's the leverage in the opposite direction. That's been harder to demonstrate, but certainly um, it's, uh, it's a possibility as well. I have another question for you, which is, is there any evidence that actual intermittent fasting and time without eating protein can be detrimental when it comes to preserve muscle mass? Or like yeah. fasting periods, very long fasting <laughs> periods. So I'll say this about intermittent fasting is if you're fasting and you're not pushing amino acids into your, into your blood on a regular basis, then you're going to end up breaking down muscle. If you're a young, healthy person, and particularly if you're engaging in, in resistance exercise or weightlifting, that's a very anabolic stimulus. So it gets you to hang on to muscle protein. So I always say to people, if you're restricting uh, calories and you don't want to lose muscle, then you, you need to lift weights. Uh, at the same time, the longer you go without eating, the more catabolic you become. Uh, for a young, healthy person, 24 hours without food, it, we're talking about you know small gram quantities of muscle loss. So you, you couldn't even measure it. It just would be would be tiny. Um, the longer you go, and so you, they have, you, you're a dietitian, you deal in clinical populations. So imagine somebody in an intensive care unit. So again, not active, not mobile, um, hypocaloric. If you went back a few years, people would keep you NPO for a certain, you know, all of these things were just really, really bad. And they noticed in these ICU patients, precipitous drops in muscle really, really early on, pretty much the same if you immobilize someone's leg or you put them on bed rest all of the same sorts of things. But intermittent fasting, um, and a lot of people say, oh, well, I take, you know, like some branch chains or I take this. And I'm like, well, if you do, you're not really fasting, but well, you know, we can skip over that. Uh, and they do it to alleviate breakdown. I, I think if somebody is young and lifting weights and you don't eat for 24 hours, you're not gonna lose so much muscle mass that I would worry about taking branch chains or HMB or something like that. Neither of which I don't think work, but um, you're not going to lose that much, but let's be clear, you know, intermittent fasting is a great strategy for fat loss, but not a great strategy for muscle gain, which is yeah. really driven by eating a lot of food. Correct. And it, in, it makes sense when we think about, well, it has worked for a lot of people that compete in bodybuilding. They just skip breakfast, but they are able to sort of reach their protein targets by the end of the day and they're not really missing out of protein. But because we were talking about the importance of protein distribution, um, it, it sort of makes some controversy of, well, if that makes sense in terms of thinking of the protein distribution trying to be as even as possible and because we don't have a storage for protein, uh, what would happen if someone just didn't have protein for 12, 16, 18 hours, and then they just eat everything in just one or two meals. So what, what, would that be a difference? Uh, would that be affecting their muscle retention? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I don't have a lot of data to go on. All I can rely on are meta-analyses that have used uh, sort of time-restricted feeding, like what you're talking about, or people call it the intermittent fasting, and they sort of, they're somewhere along the same scale um, and the fat loss that you get versus say a persistent energy deficit is about the same and the weight loss is about the same. Now I haven't looked into, you know, then partitioning it out. You would think then that the muscle loss, if you're going to lose any, would be about the same. Now, once again, none of those studies or very few at least have been done when somebody's lifting weights as well. And, and, and that's a, that's a much more potent um, activity to undertake as opposed to eating protein 
to help you hang on to muscle. So if you're lifting weights, chances are that's not a, you're not going to lose muscle you're, or you're going to lose so much, so little that you couldn't even, uh, you couldn't measure it, but you would definitely get a lot leaner uh, if you were to do that. Uh, it, and, it, you know, let's, let's face it. If you're a bodybuilder and you're cutting down to about 4% body fat, then you've got to have some, you've got to be pretty tough from here above, right? Like it, there's some mental uh, games that go on when you're doing that as well. So I think most people can drive body fat down fairly low. And then at a certain point, it's like pulling on an elastic band, right? It just gets harder and harder and harder to, to stretch it at some point. But I think most people would be okay going without a few meals, not a big deal. It's just not the ideal way to build muscle. But those guys generally go through, and the women too, they, they bulk and then they lean out and, and, and they do it in cycles like that. Some do it closer together and you can gain while you're in a deficit. It's just not the best way to gain muscle. No, a hundred percent. And I actually had a conversation yesterday with Chris Bar Bar oh, yeah. Um, and we had a really good conversation about body recomposition and this is definitely yeah. possible. You can have some oh, muscle yeah. gain. Uh, it's still being a calorie deficit. Obviously you can be in a very large calorie deficit. If it's yeah. very small and you're still doing like paying attention to a lot of different strategies and factors like your sleep, stress management, really making sure you're eating adequate amount of protein and good quality protein that makes sense to being able to achieve those results in a, a more optimal way now yeah like bo body recomposition happens like uh, yeah and th this is something that, that that i've reversed my own you know what i used to tell people so when i first started teaching at the university i was like you can't gain muscle and lose fat you know and then a bunch of people like particularly uh you know, aesthetic sport athletes, or uh, particularly some of the boxers or wrestlers, they would say, oh, I'm pretty sure we do that all the time. And I was like, no, 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 you just, you know, you just weigh yourself on a scale, you don't know what your body composition is. And we've now done several studies where we've had people in an energy deficit, sometimes a pretty deep one. And I think you're right, I think you then have to optimize all of the other things. So the dosing, the quality, you got to get good sleep, and so everything. And so yeah, to your point, you're right. All of the things that probably matter not as much when you're eating a lot of food uh, begin to matter a lot more when you're not eating much food. So, uh, but but it's definitely possible. And I think, um, yeah, fighters, all kinds of uh, athletes, gymnasts, they, they do it all the time. Why, let me ask you something. Uh, why leucine is the most important amino acid determinant of capacity for protein affecting MPS. Why losing? What, what does it have in a special? Yeah, I, you know, I've been asked that before and I, I, I don't know. Um, we do know this is that if you, so if you eat, let's say, you know, 100 grams of protein to make the math easy, um, only about 50 odd percent of it actually makes it out into circulation. So your liver gets the first call on it. So it first pass clears a lot of amino acids and uses them for making liver proteins and all kinds of things. But the amino acids that do come out in your uh, hepatic vein and go into circulation are really enriched in branch chains. So leucine, isoleucine and valine. And not surprisingly, they're also enriched in peripheral tissues like skeletal muscle. So um, why leucine more than the other branch chains? I wish I had a good answer for you. Um, I don't. Um, but I think it probably has something to do with there's very few uh, substitutes for, for a tRNA for leucine. So it can only bind to one and maybe that's the reason why it's, but it's, it's quite conserved evolutionarily. If you look through from yeast all the way to mammals, it, it's leucine that uh, is the kickstarter amino acid for protein synthesis. And I think that ties really well to what I was going to ask in terms of protein quality. Um, how do you determine which one is better? When, when, some, when we think about the protein quality, we always think, well, you know that plant-based is not as high quality as animal-based. Why is this? Is that because of the digestibility and bioavailability? Is that the amount of amino acids obviously are not complete proteins? And we think about a full 
pool of proteins of essential amino acids come from animal protein sources. What, what would be your, your, your take on how do you determine protein quality to make sure we're really getting adequate amount of protein from our choices? Yeah, I, I think protein quality is most easily explained by saying there's two factors that uh, affect it. One is the digestibility, as you mentioned, and really what we're talking about in uh, plant-based protein sources is if you're eating plants, they're uh, higher in fiber and they've got other compounds that interfere with the enzymes that break down proteins. And so that reduces the, your body's efficiency of using the protein that you're ingesting. So no fiber in uh, animal source proteins, no uh, digestive enzyme inhibitors. And then if you, so if you take away that from the plant protein, so let's say you isolate the protein from, you know, soy or, or pea or whatever, um, then the comparisons are much more even if you like, and it's the, the content of essential amino acids that determines the, the quality score. So, and there again, um, you know, mother nature, uh, animal-based proteins have more essential amino acids and higher levels than plant proteins do. Soy is probably the top of the, the ladder, but there are some sort of, I won't call them obscure, we're beginning to learn more and more, but um, isolated protein sources from things like uh, wheat, um, peas, potatoes, et cetera. But the interesting part is, and, and it's always fascinating to me to look at this from the world over is that no matter where you go, where there, there is protein in relatively short supply and people don't tend to eat as, as much animal protein, they've always figured out that it's a grain and a legume paired together. So if you go to the Caribbean, it's red beans and rice. If you go to South America, it's corn and black beans. If you go to India or Southeast Asia, it's lentils and rice or, you know, some form of uh, soy and rice. And, you know, so there must be some evolutionary pressure. And of course, we now know that it's complementation of these proteins that gives you all of, or a better profile of essential amino acids. But I find, I think that's, that's fascinating to me that people have figured that out. So clearly, you know, evolutionary pressure has said, you got to eat a grain and a legume together, because if you're just a grain eater, you don't do so well, you know, so didn't get all the amino acids that are in the other part of the, the, the vegetables. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I mean, the way to make up for poorer quality protein, if you're a, a vegan or if you're a veget vegetarian, if you're eating um, milk and, and eggs, it's a non-issue, uh, is just to eat a little bit more. Um, I'm pretty sure, and you know, w there's a little bit of data that uh, I'm aware of that says once you get up to about 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram per day, it doesn't matter whether you're getting it from animal or plant sources in terms of muscle mass gain, you're getting enough protein. So okay. no big deal. I was actually going to ask you that. The, usually we hear a lot, like if you're really going to be a vegan, especially vegans, uh, and you need to reach certain protein targets, you will need to actually eat more than that to sort of compensate for the lack of what you're not really absorbing or why is, what is happening there? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think that there's, I, 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 this would be speculation is that I do think that being on vegan vegetarian diets changes your gut microbiome. And the microbiome, then uh, you begin to get bacteria that one theory is, is that they actually begin to make some of the essential amino acids and maybe you get them that way. I don't know. Um, or maybe it's that you adapt to this different type and level of protein and you're able to become more efficient at us utilizing protein as well. Um, I, I don't want to say too much because the data is not mine. I'm, I am part of it, but uh, all I'll say is that I think once you get to 1.6, I don't think that the, it, like if you're eating animals or plant, it doesn't matter. Um, that's so, that's enough, enough protein. So, but if you were a vegetarian or vegan and you 1.6 are coming from plants, is that enough? If it's only for plants? That, that probably would be the question talking uh, like differently, asking the, the, the question differently. 
Yeah, I, I think the, um, again, to come back to the understanding that we have of what, it, what is it that drives muscle growth is that um, the weightlifting gets, you know, so if 100% of the response is here, the weightlifting is really getting you to about 80 to 90%. And the extra protein is is just a little layer on top. I don't think that it's like I doubt whether there's that many people, particularly in westernized societies, that are deficient or low in protein to the degree that it would limit their muscle growth. It might slow it down, uh, but eventually, if they lift enough, they will get there. So this is why you know these examples in movies like Game Changers of you know plant. Uh, or vegan weightlifters, it, it shouldn't surprise anybody because um, you know the, the primary driver of muscle growth is is weightlifting. It's protein. Get it once you've got sufficient. As long as you're above that level, you're good to go. Say something that is really, uh, I guess, very a bit controversial is what happens if you are eating to someone who is eating very low protein and suddenly you start giving them just a little bit more, but maybe there's, it's still not enough to reach their targets. Is that something that would still, you see a benefit straight away just from increasing 0.2, 0.3 grams above what they're currently doing? Yeah, good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that um, because I don't know that we've, we have enough studies of people with, the, with those types of protein intakes. Here's what I do know is that if you have kids who are growing, so growth as, a, as an outcome is obviously on a, on a global scale is particularly important in food insecure regions. If you have kids that are consuming inadequate protein, you only need to add, and, and it's, it's, it's really small amounts of, so if the, a food program comes in and delivers uh, skim milk powder or egg powder or something like that, to add to a, a diet that's predominantly consisting of, you know, tuberous vegetables, for example, uh, then you get you get growth acceleration in, in children, and uh, you can notice the effects quite quickly. Uh, in adults, you know, once you're done growing, uh, I'd imagine there is a benefit. Um, I think that you know the patient populations are probably the best place to argue that you know low protein intakes, then you add a little bit more, and you you get a big return. Um, in most people who think they might be protein deficient, I think that their protein probably not deficient, but maybe suboptimal. And uh, it's harder than to see the difference, but it probably exists, but it's probably small. You need a lot of people to show the effect. Um, and I don't think that we have those types of data. A lot of anecdotal stuff, I feel better, you know, my training's better, that sort of thing. And, you know, if that works, go for it. Awesome. I am conscious of your time, so I'll ask you a very quick two more questions and, and I let you go. So yep. before protein before sleep, how beneficial is this? Uh, well, I'm quoting all of this work, um, uh, or the majority of it comes from Luke Van Loon's lab. Uh, Mike Ormsby's lab has done some really great work in this area as well. So I'm, I'm just telling you what I hear. Uh, and again, it's, it's a privilege to uh, give talks in a lot of other great places and appear on the same program as Luke, who is a good friend. Um, I think the the effect is there. Uh, sleep is an opportunity. It's it's a regenerative phase, right? So I do think that um, you know if you're an athlete and you're looking to you know climb on that podium, maybe these small adjustments are a, a big deal. Um, the, the evidence on what the outcomes are and the muscle mass gain and strength is, is not quite as strong as I might like to say, for sure you should do it, like it's gonna have a big impact. But some people, uh, when, they, when they implement it, get a big boost and they feel great. Other people don't like it. Other people don't want anything in their stomach. They say they, some people say they get hot. I don't know, that's maybe a thermic effect, but, um, so it's sort of mixed right now. I think if you were to get Luke on here or Joran Tromelin is a, another guy who's done a ton of great work in this area or Mike Ormsby, he could give you a, or they could give you a better answer than I could, but uh, try it, see what you think. Um, if, if you feel like it's benefiting you, why not? If, if, what if it was a like jam pop 
is it would be probably a bit more meaningless yeah i i think it's like a lot of things right i, I said we, we tend to see effects if we're pushing somebody into extremes or we've got people who are lower in terms of a functional outcome if you have older frail people for example these things tend to show up easier so when we take you know everybody the mere mortals like myself i i don't think it's as as big a deal as um you might expect to see but i i'm i'm not looking to uh compete every day except with myself on the bike over here or in the weight room um but some athletes uh, do feel they, they they get a big boost out of it but you're right in the general population maybe not so much okay and now the last one is is this a statement that all meat is correlated with higher cancer risk how true is this because i i've read a lot of systematic reviews and that seems to say the opposite but maybe we, we need to look at the type of meat uh, or maybe the habits that go beside your eating meat for example if you eat meat, are you eating vegetables as well? Or what, what would be your take on that? Uh, I'm a healthy skeptic when it comes to um, epidemiological associations. So to me, when you get relative risks, so in our, our interval that are 1.2 or 1.3, uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to those because I think that there's so much noise in the data that it's it's hard to pull out the, the confounders that uh, you describe, no matter how hard people try. Uh, and it's always a mathematical removal or confounder that's taken away. It's never biological. I, I would say this is if that there's a type of meat, then it would probably come down to smoked or cured meats, probably as a greater driver of that relationship than regular um, meat per se. Uh, there's probably some subtypes and you could argue for red meat. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that either. Uh, I still think, and this, this would be a perfect point to, to end, is that uh, I always say to people that uh, exercise and physical activity is the forgiver of many sins. So if you're going to adopt an extreme, you know, carnivorous lifestyle, if that's what you do, it's not how I eat. I don't like meat, but I, I don't like it that much. Um, then you had best be physically active. And so, uh, you know, like it, the, the, the statistic I always give is that even if you're, if you're a smoker and that's just, you know, that's, that's like, you know, I mean, you're killing yourself slowly um, and you're physically active, your risk of death is lower. And I'm like, anything that can push your risk of death from smoking down is, uh, is a big deal. Now, not too many physically active smokers, I'll agree, but uh, forgiving a lot of sins. So um, if you're gonna do something that's probably not a good idea or maybe an extreme in one direction or another, make sure you're physically active. That's awesome. Great, uh, I would say, well, well, great message to sort of end up our conversation. <laughs> Just be physically active, you're going to make some sins when it comes to food. Well, it's not a, it's not a, it, like, it's not a vaccine. And no, everybody knows what vaccines are these. It's definitely not a vaccine. I just read the other day, uh, one of my contemporaries. So a, a very good Canadian uh, women's rower, uh, she died of cancer at 55. So it's not a vaccine. There's no question about that. But the risk of most chronic diseases is much lower in people who are physically active. So, um, and quality of life, uh, I think tends to be better, so. And I think that associates really well with that statement of like there you just can't over over train or like outrun a bad diet, but you actually you can't out train no diet. Oh no, I, I got um how I, don't I, don't know. Know. You, <laughs> you, you, I know what you mean, but yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. bottom the bottom line is 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 if you don't if you don't train I think that it's hard to out nutrition oh, for health. Yeah. No, not impossible, but if you train, I think you can get away with a few luxuries. So, you know, that glass of wine or that piece of, uh, you know, cake or whatever. Um, people say, you know, why do you train now? And I always say, so I can eat that piece of cake and not have to worry about it. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Now, is there any new projects coming your way this year? 
any new studies, research? Well, I'd love to be able to tell you that there's a lot going on, but uh, we've been out of the lab for almost a year now. Um, the focus is, is squarely in the lab is in uh, protein and aging. Um, the older I get, the more interested I get in that. You know, somebody said is that research becomes me search, right? Is that, a, yeah, yeah, so, um, but yeah, in, in aging and the prevention or mitigation of sarcopenia and trying to do as much as we can to keep people as physically active and living in their own homes and doing all the things that people associate with a good quality of life for sure. That's awesome. I uh, look so so much forward to see those results because again, I am always working in the hospital and that's what I see every day. Every day. I'm working yeah. against sarcopenia and muscle loss, especially in patients that are bedridden or they are not yeah. really moving very much. So I think that's very important. Absolutely. Well, Stu, thank you so much for coming along. I appreciate your time, um, all your your wisdom, um, everything you have spoken to us today. So, um, is any anywhere that people could find you, where uh, anywhere you're quite active that you can sort of people can go and extract from your brain some ideas? Sure. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having me on the show, Astrid. Real, real pleasure. A always great to uh, hopefully get a little bit of translation out to some uh, some people who might not be aware. But uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm uh, Mackin Prof. M A C K I N P R O F. Uh, I am on Facebook as well, Stuart Phillips, uh, PhD. And uh, I do spend a little bit of time on Instagram, although not as much. But I'm Mackin Prof on Instagram as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your time. See you soon. My pleasure. Take care, stay healthy, wash your hands, all that stuff. I will. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care, Astrid.